Uh, good evening, everybody. Hi, you're very welcome to the uh, first of our uh, conversations here for this term at LSE. Uh, we've had Keir Stormer, uh, we've had uh, Baroness Hale, and we had just before Christmas a remarkable uh, discussion with Mr. Justice Peter Jackson. These are all now on the web, and uh, they're a fascinating resource, uh, particularly listening to Peter talking about being a judge. So if you haven't looked at it, I recommend that you perhaps could. Uh, now this evening, we're very lucky to have, uh, I mean that, uh, Joshua Rosenberg. And uh, I'll be asking him a bit earlier, later on about social media, of which he is a tremendous exponent and proponent, possibly even. Uh, if you have any questions and you feel you don't want to raise your arm, you're in an economy of movement, mode, then what you can do is use a finger to send a tweet to at LSE Law, and you can hashtag it, LSE Rosenberg. It's currently obscured by Rosenberg, but that's... <laughs> <laughs> I hate it when real life gets in the way of social media. Uh, and uh, the debonair, some say in the office, preppily dressed, Bradley, who is our designated Twitter guru, will, if he judges it appropriate, something's happening, glass has been brought, will, if he judges it appropriate, draw to our attention, and we may well ask it. Uh, and we have a large number of tweets already. But this incredible commitment to the newfangled does not rule out the old-fashioned, indeed rather charming idea that I ask some of you at some point whether you have a question. And it is permissible to ask a question using what I think used to be called in the old days your vocal cords. So that'll happen too. Uh, the evening starts with, with me uh, just uh, having a few questions uh, of Joshua. Uh, he's not going to tell us himself that he was educated in Hammersmith, nor is he going to tell us that he did a law degree at Wadham College, currently with, I think they call them wardens, Lord MacDonald, who was a visiting professor here for a number of years. Uh, interestingly, and it'll be one of my questions, qualified as a solicitor in 1976. And then there is the, you know, the Agatha Christie had a missing week. Well, Joshua has a missing eight years because in 1984, he launched Law in Action uh, for Radio 4, which is still on the go. Tremendous program, shifted around in the timetable. But I'll be probing what went on during those eight years Joshua, the missing eight years as a solicitor. Uh, because uh, Joshua's obviously stayed very closely associated with the media ever since. He's been BBC's legal correspondent for 15 years, uh, then moved to the Daily Telegraph uh, in the year 2000, I'm told, to edit legal coverage, eight years there. And now uh, writes a weekly commentary for The Guardian, Guardian Online, and is back, Law and Action, we hear you. Terrific, from, 19, from 2010. Uh, writes for the Law Society Gazette. I mean, it's a tremendous range of engagements in various media. Has also uh, written a number of books, I remember reading uh, and, and really relying on very well-researched contemporary accounts of legal issues, which uh, have been extremely helpful to academics. So there's a helpful at the level of the day-to-day -day and a helpful at the level of the reflection and a helpful at the level of the academic. And uh, one thing I think sums up Joshua's hard work, actually. Uh, I remember he led with a really well uh, done story on something that uh, Baroness Hale had said in the course of one of these conversations. You don't mind me saying this in public, do you, Joshua? And uh, it had been an event like this, and he'd come along characteristically and taken notes and so on and asked some questions. And he made news, because Brenda Hale Baroness Hale made news. And a colleague from an esteemed rival organ, I think they're called in private eye, wanted to know, rang us up, got straight through, I think, to the Twitter guru, and said, why didn't you tell me about that event? I, I should have broken that story. And the answer is, you know, do your homework. Come along to events on a wet October evening and listen. And so I think one of the characteristics of 
if I may say so, Joshua, your success is that kind of hard work and application. So we're delighted. He thought nobody would come, nobody at all. Uh, we're delighted that uh, you've not only agreed to come, but that so many people have agreed to come to hear you. Uh, you were, I'm told, in 2012, the only journalist to feature in the Times Law 100, uh, which is the source, uh, the subject of an article I wrote in Obiter magazine, uh, not your bit. Uh, and you've honorary doc doctorates from the University of Hertfordshire and Nottingham Trent, which reflects, I think, the uh, esteem you are held in academe. And you're an honorary venture of Gray's Inn, uh, which reflects the esteem you're held in the professions. Now, that's a heck of a range. And the way we're going to do this is I'm going to start, as I said, by asking some questions. And the very first question I'm going to ask as I walk over to assume a kind of conversational pose, and remember to tweet things, he is now walking over, hashtag <laughs> LSE Rosenberg. He has now sat down, hashtag LSE Rosenberg. Uh, the question I'm going to ask as I move over is what went on in those eight years? Did you hate, I was a solicitor, I, I lasted a half a day in the office. <laughs> It was my uncle's office. A chap came in to ask me about something. I thought it was a legal issue. I couldn't answer. It wasn't a legal issue at all. He wanted to know where he'd left his TV license. Why did you give up the solicitor's profession? Did you enjoy it? And how did you get, as it were, the idea of a radio series which became Law and Action? I left the law in 1975. And as you perceive, um, there was a gap between uh, leaving the law firm in Richmond, Surrey, where I was trained as a solicitor, and qualifying um, the following year. Um, in the meantime, I went to a crammer in Landidno in the winter, run by a former solicitor who'd been struck off for dishonesty. Um, <laughs> his name was Desmond Dunphy, and he was well known for being able to get the thickest students through the Law Society's exams. I know this very well because I used to bump into them uh, subsequently. Um, and uh, I had no trouble getting um, what was regarded as a, a perfectly safe second-class degree from the University of Oxford. The uh, University of Oxford in those days um, did students the courtesy of not uh, dividing second class degrees, so you never knew whether you had got an upper second or a lower second, you just got a second class degree, which was very egalitarian. Um, it was impossible to get a third or a first, uh, at least that's how I, how I saw it. And um, so, uh, despite getting a law degree, I uh, had a little bit of a difference of agreement with the Law Society's examiners, as a result of which I found myself in this, this crammer trying to finish off one or two exams in which I had failed to satisfy the examiners. And so I didn't actually qualify as a solicitor until after I had been at the BBC oh. uh, for a while. Now, I joined the BBC in 1975. Even though I started Law in Action 30 years ago in 1984, um, I joined as a trainee in 1975. The answer to your question, how I joined the BBC as a trainee when I was living a perfectly blameless life as a trainee solicitor, is that uh, one Sunday afternoon, um, a friend of mine, a couple, one of them was working at the BBC in a secretarial role, and uh, she said the BBC were advertising for trainee journalists. They do a training scheme for journalists, or they did in those days. And um, this friend said to my wife, um, who was then training as a journalist, but at a newspaper, uh, was she interested in joining the BBC and joining their training scheme? My wife said no, she was perfectly happy um, with newspaper journalism and um, she, and I still can't quite remember whether it was the friend or my wife, said well why don't you apply? So I applied, you know, on a whim uh, to the BBC. Um, I thought it might be rather fun, it sounded rather glamorous, it said candidates will be required to take a voice test, which sounded rather exciting. Um, and I applied, um, and they said, what are you doing now? And I said, I'm a trainee solicitor, and uh, I was 24, which was slightly older than the, the normal graduates, a couple of years older, perhaps. Um, anyway, to my amazement, um, after interviews and tests, including the voice test, I was offered a place on the training scheme. So I had to decide whether to take it or not, and my approach in life has always been, if opportunities come along, you take them. If people ask you to do things, you try and say yes rather than try and, which is why I'm here now, of course. Mm. Um, and uh, so um, I thought, if I don't take this opportunity, I will spend my life as a solicitor always wondering what would have happened to me if I had joined the BBC. Um, so uh, I thought better to take the BBC position 
um, and wonder what would have happened to me if I had stayed as a solicitor. Um, I think that's easier to predict. Anyway, I stayed on the staff of the BBC for 25 years and then left to join the Daily Telegraph, as you say. Yeah, so you don't lie awake at night wondering whether you'd have been senior partner in Clifford Chance or LinkedIn. I, I, I know perfectly well I wouldn't. I would have stayed a suburban solicitor um, and um, no doubt be um, out of a job by now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I wonder. I doubt it very much. What about the various types of communication, the television, radio, print, internet, do, I mean, it's very unusual to have somebody who's been able to play across all of them. Mm. They require different skills, don't they? They do. Well, it's quite interesting. I mean, towards the end of my time in the BBC, um, we were piloting um, a new form of communication. Um, the BBC is very keen on piloting, trying out things. And, and somebody had this idea that the BBC might have um, what was going to be called a website um, on which news would appear. Um, when was this? This was in the late 1990s. The BBC News website started in 1997 uh, by accident. Um, the point was that if somebody had had to sit down in the BBC and say, right, we're going to spend a lot of money on a website, there might have been people who thought this wasn't the right thing to do. So um, what happened was um, it was done without anybody knowing or noticing, which most of the best BBC things are. It was done from the bottom up. They had a, a website to provide the results of the 1997 general election. Politics 97, it was called, because a general election generates a great deal of statistical information, stuff that you can't really put on uh, the radio or, 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 or even show on television. So they had a website um, to provide data on each constituency, which could be looked up on the internet. And that was fine. And after the election, they kept it there for people who wanted to know who their MP was, how many votes, and so on. And then six months later, um, less than six months later, um, uh, Diana, Princess of Wales, was killed in Paris. And they thought, oh, we could perhaps provide information about the aftermath, the consequences, the reaction, and we could just reuse this website that was still there um, following the general election and put information there. And it could be election and news about the royal family. And that carried on, and then they thought, well, why stop? You know, mm. And that's how the BBC News website started. But just before that, we were piloting what would happen and how you'd get news agency stories and how you'd write them for uh, the website and this new medium and how it would work. It's fascinating. Mm -hmm. And is there different ways of writing? Mm. For, and obviously TV, mm. I, I mean, which one have you preferred? Uh, and what are the different skills in each? Mm. Radio is a more efficient way of communicating um, radio is, well, I was going to say radio is the quickest way of carrying um, news. I don't think it is, really, um, in a way, um, because, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you an example of, of how quickly news gets out and how things change and how you have to um, uh, keep up to date. Let me start by giving you an old example. Before the broadcasting of Parliament, um, there was a, a man called Christopher Jones, who was the BBC's parliamentary correspondent, a man with 100 words a minute shorthand, um, who would sit in the gallery of the House of Commons and rush out and tell people, using a studio you know, only very, very close to the gallery of the House of Commons, what had been said in Parliament. And that was the quickest way of finding out what the Prime Minister of the day had said, what the opposition leader had said. Sit there, listen to what's said, write it down, rush out and speak into a microphone. Very, very quick. Anyway, he, he was very well established. And then suddenly, sound broadcasting of Parliament was permitted. Um, the experimental sound broadcasting um, was as long ago as 1976 and in the House of Lords, but it, it, it came after that. And suddenly he was out of a job because um, he would tell, he would ring up the PM program and he would say, I've heard this in Parliament. And they'd say, well, actually, we heard it as well, and we're not quite sure about your interpretation of it, and we prefer our interpretation because we heard the actual words rather than your summary. So he was out of a job. Um, my um, out of a job moment came when I was at Westminster Magistrates Court, which in those days was in Horsfree Road, for one of the early appearances of Julian Assange, um, not very long ago. Um, uh, this was about extradition. And um, I got in um, by chance, even though it was very crowded, and I had a, a, a booking to appear on Sky News about 45 minutes later. Um, so I left after the first half hour of the hearing and rushed off 
to the Millbank studios, rushed in front of the camera, and was about to tell the presenters what I had heard in court. And I knew I was the only person who'd left court after half an hour, so I thought I had the information. Um, but to my surprise, the presenter in Osterley seemed to know just as much about what had been happening in court as I did. And that was because at that stage, Sky had started um, printing, publishing, uh, broadcasting tweets on the screen, um, reading them out rather rashly. They just, um, you know, anybody who put a sand in a tweet, it was on the screen, which is not necessarily editorial control. They wouldn't do that now. But nevertheless, they were able to tell more quickly than I could roughly what was going on in mm. court. And that was a cautionary tale. And a month or so after that, I decided I had to get onto Twitter yeah. because uh, there was another hearing a week later. I couldn't get into court. And the only way I could find out what was going on was by craning over somebody's um, shoulder and seeing what was on their Twitter screen on their, on their iPhone. About two or three years ago, you went on yeah. Twitter. And you got what? I, I, I started on Twitter, <coughs> almost, I think it's almost exactly three years ago now. Yeah. Um, yeah. But 20,000 followers you've got, yeah. apparently. Yeah. I mean, do you, do you just drive them to your work? or I mean, we're interested in the whole thing because we yeah. try and do this here for this sort of event. Yeah. But is it about telling people about your life or is it about commenting on f events? or what, what? I mean, if you lead a very amusing life, um, and few of us do, um, then perhaps people will follow you to find out what you do. Um, if you lead a moderately amusing life, but you, know, you happen to be somebody I know, um, and I want to know what you're up to, then I'll follow you. Mm -hmm. There's one person I know who leads quite an entertaining life, and I follow her tweets just to see what she's up to, and it's always quite jolly, and it's fine. But that's because I know her, and I, yeah. you know, I like reading about what she's up to and what she's doing, and so she's a journalist. Um, who, and, uh, you know, I'm rather fond of her, and that, that's fine. This must be your wife. It's not it? my <laughs> wife. It's not my wife. I actually communicate with my wife uh, in other ways as well as on Twitter, um, <laughs> although you'd be surprised. So... Um, uh, uh, but uh, I, I hope that the people who follow me on Twitter do so because they're not going to know what I had for dinner. Um, I have, I admit, um, retweeted uh, Bradley's excellent tweets advertising this event several times, probably too many, thus boring my followers, um, but no more than once every couple of days um, to encourage people to come along if they choose to. But I'm not tweeting what I'm saying now, as you can see, no hands. Um, and you are, yes. And, um, uh, and I do not plan to refer um, afterwards to this event on Twitter because there wouldn't be any point. And I use Twitter to break stories if I ever get them and perhaps more so to alert people to more substantial pieces that I've written or indeed to alert people to things that other people have written um, that they think are worthwhile, or to alert people to things that I haven't got the time or the scope to write about, but I think they may want to know about, and that I think I can usefully encapsulate in one or two tweets. Yeah, yeah. well, we'll we come to the mm. audience on Twitter in a minute, but I have mm. a question just mm. before we do. I mean, mm. you've been around a, f a while, right? Who's the most impressive judge? I mean, when you came into the game, there was Lord Diplock, there was Lord Denning, we've had the late Lord Bingham. Who's been the most impressive judge that you've observed in this period of coverage of legal affairs? You've been close to it than anybody else. I remember Lord Diplock. Um, he was very old when I first started um, observing him. Um, I went to see Lord Denning on his birthday and said, uh, on his 90th birthday, and I, I said to him at the end of an interview, um, while we're here, just um, how would you like to be, um, how do you like to be remembered? He said, oh, you want that for my obituary, don't you? And I said, yes. <laughs> this was long before he died, by the way. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah, 10 yeah. years before he died. Um, and, and, you know, and he said um, something like, in remembrance of uh, good deeds, that is how I would like to be remembered. Because he always put on the accent, you know, when he was broadcasting. Um, and um, sure enough, you know, I was still at the BBC um, when he died, um, um, at the age of 100. Um, and um, uh, we finally broadcast it. Um, but Denning has gone out of favour these mm. days, completely. Mm. Um, and one of the reasons was um, he was rather too keen on the old palm tree justice. He was rather too keen on you know, bending the law to fit his conception of what the law ought to be, I think, if that's not too, too much of an oversimplification. Um, 
There are judges I was very fond of. Michael Davis, who was the great libel judge until you know, before um, David Eady, um, and um, was pretty robustious, and, 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 um, but ne nevertheless good fun and really quite fond of journalists. Um, and lots of other judges who I knew and know. But, I mean, the most distinguished judge, the cleverest judge, the, the most effective judge must be Lord Bingham. Bingham. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And are you sometimes appalled by how the media treat judges? I mean, not you, as it were, but there's been increasing quite personal attacks. I'm thinking of the editor of the Mail laying into judges who were responsible for the development of the law of privacy. Mm. That wouldn't have happened generations ago. Do you feel sometimes your own profession has disgraced itself, or do you think that this is proper and appropriate inquiry? Um, I can be quite critical of judges. I was quite critical in a piece I wrote yesterday um, of a judge. Um, um, you know, I, I hope I was fair. I hope I wasn't too offensive. But I think I was probably quite direct. Um, I haven't had any complaints. Um, but uh, you're quite right. Um, the Daily Mail and its editor, Paul Dacre, laid into Mr. Justice Eady when he was the libel and privacy judge, um, just as the media has laid into Sir Brian Leveson um, when he was conducting the inquiry that he did. Um, it's fine for the press to be robust, but they must be well informed. Um, what journalists, the phrase that journalists like most of all is top judge. And top judge usually means um, a recorder or a deputy high court judge, in other words, a part-time judge. Um, uh, senior judge probably means a circuit judge. A very senior judge might be a high court judge. And beyond that, they don't really understand yeah. you know, the differences of grade. And they presumably don't get their head around Lord Justice Judge at all. That would oh, be too well, complicated I mean, by far, wouldn't see, it? Nominative <laughs> determinism is, is wonderful in the law. Um, but no, that's right. He was always, people loved calling him Judge Judge, um, even though he never was a circuit judge. No. You know. And the biggest story you've ever been involved in, miscarriage of justice, others? Well, in 20, 25 years? the miscarriages of justice, the Birmingham Six, the Guildford Four, the Maguires, and cases like that, I did cover um, because I started covering law for the BBC in 1984, 1985, that period. So those were big and exciting cases. Um, and I do remember a particular incident when it became clear to us that the Crown was going to throw in the towel on one of these cases, um, you know, it, and, uh, a day the following day, and that, that was pretty startling. Um, and I do remember um, um, covering um, the Birmingham Six being released um, from prison. And, you know, you had to work out which of them was which, given that uh, the, all we had to go on was photographs taken 15 years earlier, mm. which was the period they'd, taken, they'd spent in prison wrongly. Mm. Um, so it was all pretty exciting stuff. I think the, the most interesting... Well, there are two stories. One was the miners' strike of 1984-1985, which was the last... Um, uh, uh, case, the last strike of significance um, in the sense that it could have brought down the Thatcher government, but it was the last strike where law was involved as a weapon by the government to, to break the strike. Um, and there were all sorts of obscure legal developments which one had to explain. One had to explain what sequestrators were. Um, the aim was to sequestrate, i.e. seize, the assets of the National Union of Mine Workers. And the official solicitor descended from the gods when it looked as if Arthur Scargill was going to be sent to prison uh, for contempt, and he ensured that Scargill wasn't sent to prison. So they were all these legal twists and turns which needed explaining. And that was how I, find my, uh, how, how I found myself um, as legal affairs reporter, which was code for you know, acting, um, getting the job of legal affairs correspondent because the BBC decided they needed somebody um, who could understand and explain all these legal niceties. And believe it was all independent because the ones you've given examples of, the Birmingham case and the minor strike and so on, some people saw those as evidence of the partisanship of law and the judges. Have you been able to retain, I'm making an assumption here, retain a kind of liberal idea of an independent judiciary through all of this? Or do you sometimes think, gosh, that's a bit of a charade? Well, they're independent um, in the sense they make up their own minds. But on the other hand, the way in which they make up their mind 
may not be may not may not be right. I mean, if you look back at the uh, these miscarriage of justice cases uh, from the 1980s, and you remember that it took a while um, to get them out. Um, it was the Birmingham Six case, wasn't it, where, where the appeal was first dismissed, mm -hmm. um, and then subsequently the evidence showed that you, know, that you couldn't rely on the police evidence. Um, and you look back at the trials and the convictions and the decisions of the Court of Appeal, you get the impression that the courts were bending the law to, as they would say, do justice. In other words, they knew perfectly well that in the days when policemen compared notes in order to make up their notebooks, that this wasn't an independent recollection um, of the events written down um, simply you know, shortly afterwards. Um, they knew that the evidence was, you know, uh, hadn't been prepared in the way that the police said, but they thought that the police thought that it was necessary to prepare evidence in this way to get convictions, and they, the judges, thought whatever has been going on behind the scenes, the police have got the right people, and we've got to lock them up because they are dangerous <coughs> terrorists. So I fear they turned a bit of a blind eye to process because they thought doing justice meant locking these people up and upholding their convictions in the, fi in the, in the face of, of appeals. So the judges were independent, but that doesn't mean that they were necessarily right. On the contrary, they weren't right, but they, as I see it, many of them thought they were doing their duty and protecting the rest of yeah, us. Yeah, I think that's, an, I would agree with that. I would agree with that. Uh, Bradley, uh, have I missed anything in my explanations of the Twitter, or do you want to go straight into a tweet? Uh, no, just to say that we have got some fantastic people in the audience tweeting away using the hashtag. I'm hugely appreciative of that, because it's making my job a lot easier. Um, but yes, if you do have any comments or questions, use the hashtag LSE Rosenberg. Don't forget it's with a Z, as you can see. Yep. And, uh, or tweet directly at LSE Law, and uh, we may ask your question a little later on. But we will go into a tweet, and the first one comes from... And you've got it in front of you. The first one Think. comes from Richard Bircher, uh, who asks, <coughs> what trends do you see impacting the pricing and affordability of legal services? And uh, Richard isn't here, is he? Because I'm mystified by his appearance. Is he here? Is Richard here? Is that him? Is this his that's tweet his, thing? That's his Twitter good, pick. Good, good, You're good. looking for somebody who has a, 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 an entirely white face, um, <laughs> but nevertheless um, a mouth outlined in, in, in black. Oh, yeah. Um, Enough gossip. All right. Um, this is a very broad question, and despite the fact that I'm staring at it, I still don't know the answer. Um, Richard Susskind has written a lot of books about the future of legal services. He talks about commoditization of legal services. He talks about um, some people being able to afford a bespoke legal service and others having to put up with... Um, a rough and ready, cheap and cheerful service. He talks about new ways in which legal services will be delivered, obviously on the internet, electronically, through kiosks for people who don't have access to the internet, although I think that's probably um, no longer necessary, um, through public libraries for people who don't have computers at home, um, and um, uh, in, 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 in general ways. You know very well that if you look at a, a website and you click on help and you have a question, it says, is your question one of the following five? Because if so, here are the following five answers um, to the most frequently answered, asked questions. In other words, um, we're going to get a much less of a personal bespoke service. Um, and I dare say a lot of legal help these days is obtained by people simply looking things up and finding out. One of the great advantages of what we've been talking about is that a huge amount of information is available online. Now, it's not perfect. You're not going to expect people to understand um, uh, judgments of the court. It requires a certain amount of skill to know which is a precedent, which is obiter, which is binding, which judgments to go for, and so on. Um, you're not even going to get, be able to get everything out of looking up the statute online on the public uh, database because it may be out of date. 
But there are plenty of law firms which are quite happy to provide answers to legal questions and, and plenty of campaign groups and so on which will do so. So a lot of um, legal services are going to be provided free of charge to those who are sophisticated enough to ask the right questions and, and do searches even on Google. Um, there is more and more need for pro bono work as there's less and less legal aid available. Um, and people involved in pro bono work are looking for more sophisticated ways of delivering it. On Monday, there was a report published by a commission supported by the Legal Action Group and chaired by Lord Lowe of Dalston, crossbench peer, um, which um, looks at ways of delivering legal services using roughly the same level of resources or not many more. Um, there, um, the um, law works and the um, other um, uh, uh, pro bono organizations are looking at ways of utilizing um, city solicitors who are reaching the end of their careers and who want to um, put something back but don't quite know how to adapt from you know, mergers and acquisitions to um, um, advocacy in the magistrate's court or whatever it may be. So there is a lot of creative thought going into um, filling the gap caused by the um, tragic reduction in the availability of legal aid. But you make, you paint, we'll go to the audience in a minute, but you paint a picture which doesn't sound that tragic. I mean, you, it sounds sort of, there you are, you know, all these old guys who've made millions will somehow or other fit in a bit of help for the poor in the middle of all their various holidays and so on. And actually there'll be lots of pro bono and everything. That doesn't sound tragic, but in fact many people do think it's totally tragic and that this government will be able to do what it wants because it knows it won't be challenged. Well, it is being challenged to a certain extent um, by the criminal bar, for example. Um, but ultimately, on the whole, the government will do what it wants in reducing legal aid. Mm. The courts may well you know, find some of its policies unlawful. Um, but ultimately, the government is the government. And if we don't like it, then we get another one in at the next election. And then we find that it does pretty much the same. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, I don't mean to underplay the tragedy of the reduction in the availability of legal aid. And what strikes me, above all, is the false economy that this involves. We all know that a few years ago, when legal aid um, was taken away uh, for personal injury work, this led to a huge rise in consequent um, work. We had no win, no fee. We had um, uh, uh, insurance. Um, we had organizations, including publicly funded defendants like the health service, paying much, much more than they would if matters had been left as they were and a small amount of legal aid, which after all was only a loan, if we're talking about civil legal aid to bring a claim for personal injury. You bring the claim, your lawyer is paid, you win the damages, you win your costs, the costs go back to the legal aid fund. So not very much money was saved and a huge amount of money was lost. Uh, similarly, um, if you haven't got legal aid to, and you're, if you're a prisoner serving an indeterminate sentence, a low level, uh, sentence for public protection on IPP, and you are in a closed prison or you are not given access to um, training, then it's very difficult for you to demonstrate that you are no longer a risk to society. It's very difficult to get yourself into an open prison, and it's only if you're in an open prison that you're going to be released, um, assuming you've served your tariff, as many of them have. So um, those who've been wrongly denied access to open conditions or proper training um, can't get legal aid under the proposals to um, uh, get themselves into the position where they're going to be let out of prison, which means they're going to spend longer in prison. They've served their tariffs, but um, it's not possible to tell whether they're safe to be released because they haven't fulfilled the criteria because the criteria aren't available to them. The consequence is that they spend longer in prison and it costs the state much more than if they'd had legal aid. But the Daily Mail is happy, as are other newspapers. Uh, you, that's, a, that's a partisan observation, not a question. Uh, do we have some questions? For, we have a lady with her hand firmly up here. I'm going to ask 
I'm going to ask you, have we got anybody over here? Got any, we've got a, have we got anybody here? Yeah, we've got a second. So let's start with these two. Say, if you can, who you are, and if you're from somewhere, tell us, like, if you're the editor of the Daily Mail or something, we should perhaps know. <laughs> and then it's probably a question, but it could be an observation, and the same sort it, it is a question, actually. Thank you very much. First of all, um, well done with your impressive career. Amazing. Um, I wish and, to and you're, you're, get you direct, are, Margaret Cooper, Media right. International. I wish to get direct to the point regarding your career at the BBC. It seems like there is a conflict of interest in all those years that the Jimmy Savile, um, obviously, crimes were committed and they were hushed up. It seems also that there is a direct link regarding conflict of interest when somebody like Rupert Murdoch can retain copyright of all those stories handed in over the years. And because now the news of the world is defunct, obviously he still retains the copyright. Hence, uh, leaves a big question mark what he can and can't do with the material. The next uh, direct, uh, which applies to me, as a litigant and person of 10 cases, Unfortunately, my ex-husband is represented by Russell Cook, who are the legal advisors to the Law Society. Apparently, you are one of their uh, journalists. So do you uh, envisage that there is a conflict of interest when all 10 court cases get struck out without merit, and even though they involved attempted murder, theft of over 800,000 pounds, locking me up for three years in Saudi Arabia, and this is the law in the UK. I think there is something very conflict of interest going on here. Thank you, Mark. We're going to take, we're going to take another one, but we'll, we'll certainly follow that one up. But we have a gentleman who's got a microphone on his left hand who is also going to tell us who he is, where he's from, and come up with a question or observation. Uh, I'm Oliver. I live around the corner. I'm just a member of the public. <laughs> Um, <laughs> That's very tweetable. <laughs> uh, so my question was sort of stemming from the reaction at the Duggan case with the, re or at least reported reaction of barracking of jurors and intimidation of jurors and some thoughts on the role of jurors would be uh, appreciated. And I guess the sort of other side of that is, do we think that jurors are in a good position to understand some of the more complex aspects of law, some kind of arcane tax case or something like that. Um, you know, what's the way of getting jurors to have a good understanding of some of the more complex areas of the law? Brilliant. Thanks, Oliver. Uh, do we have a third? Let's go to these. We have a hand that went up and then plunged down. Sir, they can get to you quite quickly. Hi, my name's Carl Gardner. I'm a law blogger. Um, you wrote a book um, in the 1990s, I think, called Trial of Strength, about conflict between judges and the government, politicians, basically. And it was a big theme at the time, and there was a lot of tension. I wonder, do you think it's, that has got worse since then? Do you think it's got a bit better? Is it much the same? But, what do you think the position is now? Thanks, Carl. And uh, we're going to fit in a fourth before we go to Joshua. Um, my name's Hannah, and I'm a family solicitor. Um, we're experiencing a situation in the family courts at the moment where um, there is an increased number of uh, litigants in person. The judge's time is becoming even more uh, pressured. You've touched already on the issues concerning uh, resources. Lord Justice Thorpe, um, a couple of years ago now, commented on the issue of forum shop shopping, and particularly um, very wealthy clients from Russia and uh, various places who are using our courts um, and have not necessarily contributed to society here. Um, this is an issue that was raised by Lord Justice Thorpe, but I haven't heard anything since, particularly in terms of um, solutions that might be presented. Uh, and ideas um, from you would be very welcome. Okay, thank you very much. Excellent. Over to you, Joshua. Okay, right. Absolutely. Well, thank let, you. let's start with conflict of interest. Um, there are conflicts of interest um, in many circumstances, but the best way of dealing with conflicts of interest is for everybody to know where everybody else stands. 
In other words, um, if you know um, that I write for a publication um, paid for by the Law Society and indeed take a fee from the Law Society for writing from it, then you can decide whether I am in the pay of the Law Society or not, um, or whether I bear a grudge uh, because its examiners uh, took a while to allow me to qualify as a solicitor uh, 40 years ago. Um, you have the information, um, you decide. Um, uh, and uh, you, uh, people from outside this country may think it's very strange that opponents in court are barristers from the same chambers. And they find it very hard to believe that individual barristers in the same set of chambers can take cases against one another, even though they know each other very well, even though they are members of the same set of chambers. Um, they find it very hard to understand how uh, a person can be a part-time judge who is often a barrister, sometimes a solicitor. Um, uh, one day uh, he or she is uh, a lawyer, and another day um, that person is sitting judgment on lawyers, uh, sitting in judgment on lawyers that that person has to deal with. Provided everybody knows, then I think you can um, avoid conflicts of interest. It's when people don't know um, that, to take an example at random, uh, one of the judges might happen to be involved in a party to the case, call it Amnesty International Charitable Trust, just for example. <laughs> and when that's not declared, that's when things go wrong. Um, next question, Duggan, uh, jurors, can they understand? Um, obviously, jurors shouldn't be barracked by um, members of the public. I think what happened in that case, um, and in a funny way you can follow it better on Twitter than by reading a report after the event, is that the jury was asked a series of questions. Um, this is very good practice in my view. It means we know much more than in the old days when the jury would simply have been asked to deliver a verdict of lawful killing, unlawful killing, open verdict or whatever. Um, they were asked, as you remember, um, whether um, uh, Duggan had um, a gun in the taxi um, when the police stopped it, answer yes. Whether he had a gun in the taxi, when in, in his hand when he was shot, answer no. Okay, that, that, was, that was what we heard. Now, members of the public, family, people in court, would presumably have inferred from the jury's finding that he didn't have a gun in his hand when he was shot by the policeman, that he was unlawfully shot. Um, if you don't really understand the law, you would think that if he was unarmed and the policeman shot him, the policeman had no justification for shooting him, and therefore he was unlawfully shot. Um, that, of course, is not the law, um, and it's not what the jury decided. So I suppose in that court, when the jury heard answer to the question, did he have a gun, no, um, was it lawful or unlawful killing, it was lawful killing, people were very shocked, very disturbed, very upset, very confused, very cross. Um, and presumably they vented their emotions. Shouldn't have happened, but it's not the most extraordinary thing in the world. Um, it's not very nice, but better to have the jury answering questions in that way, so we know where everybody stands, we know what they thought, than simply you know, uh, handing a piece of paper to the coroner um, with a verdict. Can they understand what's going on? Well, I got into trouble by reacting, perhaps slightly overreacting, um, to the jury in the first trial of um, Chris Hugh and Vicky Price, who returned some extraordinary questions mm. to the judge, from which one could only infer that they hadn't a clue what was going on, or at least some of them didn't. And I got quite worried by, by this and, and said, you know, this is all rather alarming. People said, well, it's just a rogue jury, and then, you know, there was another trial, and it you know, seemed to go sensibly, and everyone seemed to understand it, and judge said he'd never come across this in all his 25 years, and, and so on and so forth. Um, I think that we rely on the jury system, um, and rightly rely on the jury system, 
But I think, like the, um, the you know the famous simile about um, uh, sausages, you don't always want to know what goes on behind the scenes. You don't want to know how sausages are made um, in order to enjoy them, and you don't really want to know how jurors go about their deliberations in order to decide whether they're doing it right or not. Possibly checking Google quite a lot to be guided. And can the system of privacy and also the system of law survive the instant access to stuff? Well, the judges seem to think so. Um, I have my doubts. I think we may well be moving to um, a state of affairs where it is accepted that jurors will find things out and they're simply told not to rely on what they find out. Uh, we know because there have been some high-profile cases where jurors have Googled the defendants and got it completely wrong um, and um, done all sorts of things yeah. that they shouldn't. Um, we know only about the people who've been found out, and there must be others who don't. Mm. So we hope that if they do find things out, then they still judge the case on the evidence. <laughs> it may be... Uh, that we're getting to the stage where we simply have to accept the reality and do as they do in the United States and other jurisdictions, accept they're going to know things and tell them just to ignore them. Yeah. The judges take the view we haven't got to that stage yet, that jurors can be told firmly, judge the case on the evidence. It's not quite as neurotic as it was. Um, jurors used to be kept in a hotel overnight while they were deliberating but that was too expensive, because um, it wasn't just one night, it was several nights. Um, and then they got up to some uh, um, hanky-panky in the hotel. Um, <laughs> I say hanky-panky, this is a technical term of law. Um, I'm referring to the, the famous case of the Ouija board, um, where the, um, um, the, uh, one of the um, jurors um, uh, tore up bits of paper. You may not know what a Ouija board is, but it's, um, the, the name um, is derived um, from the word yes in French and German. Um, and um, they used to, uh, he tore up, and um, it was one of these things where you, you put a glass in the middle of, a, of the table, and um, a hidden hand um, sort of grabs the arm of the person holding the glass, and it points to sort of letters of the alphabet, and it spells out, yes, he's guilty, he did it, <laughs> or, or words to that effect. Anyway, when this emerged, because one of the jurors was rather upset by this, the idea of, you know, supernatural going Kill on. joy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm told the judge. Um, they were very worried, and Lord Justice Taylor, um, who was um, rather shocked by this, um, kept the whole thing under reporting restrictions until the retrial that he ordered, uh, because I think he was rather embarrassed that the jury had... Um, had, um, had uh, behaved in this way. So they do some funny things, um, but um, I still think overall that they are a safeguard against oppression, and I'm still in favour of keeping the jury um, for, uh, the, 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 for, for criminal matters, although we have, I think, effectively abolished them in civil cases. Yeah, yeah I've diverted you from Carl and then from right. Hannah, um, I think. Yes. Um, Trial of Strength was a book published in 1997, and... Um, it began with an observation which couldn't happen now of um, the law lords sitting as they did in a committee of committee room in the House of Parliament and deciding a case against the Home Secretary of the day um, in the morning and then going back um, and uh, downstairs to the chamber and um, taking part in debates on policies of the government of the day. Now, the law lords, before they were transformed into the Supreme Court, adopted a self-denying ordinance, um, and they wouldn't take part in politics in the way that some of them did, um, you know, even as recently as 1997. But there was a, quite a lot of tension between... Um, the government that I was writing about, which was the end of the Conservative government with Michael Howard as Home Secretary, um, and the judges. And there were tensions. And these tensions have reappeared subsequently. Um, and, you know, there have been uh, Labour Home Secretaries who have been quite rude about the judges of the day. Not so much under the coalition government these days. Um, but there were times when uh, ministers really got rather impatient. 
And Derry Irvin, as Lord Chancellor, told the judges that you shouldn't cheer when you win your cases and you shouldn't boo when you lose them. You should be a bit more dignified. And you shouldn't attack the judges. Now, curiously, the present government is rather praying in aid, some of the judges, Igor Judge, for example, in support of its policies, real or supposed, on human rights and withdrawing from the convention. Um, whether they are entirely right in relying on <coughs> legal principles um, taken, wrenched from a rather longer discussion of the law, um, is a matter on which lawyers can argue. But on the whole, I think most ministers recognize that if they are too critical of the judges, it's very, very damaging. On the other hand, there have been examples where they've been critical. What you have at the moment is the government transferring its animosity against the judges towards the Strasbourg judges, mm -hmm. which are a much easier target in all sorts of ways. Um, and on the whole, um, you get the impression that things aren't too bad, but that's partly because of a self-denying ordinance of the judges themselves. Um, the judges had um, some very um, anxious and important discussions um, with the government on the subject of their pensions um, until a few months ago uh, when the judges lost wholesale their arguments and the government's views prevailed. Um, they suffered a significant loss of income um, as a result of effective cuts in their pensions, increased contributions, and so on, which is probably quite damaging to recruitment to the judiciary, is even conceivably um, a breach of contract in that you know, they joined on the basis they were getting a, a certain amount and they're going to get less. But nevertheless, the judges decided quite shrewdly that there was absolutely no point in complaining publicly that the government had double-crossed them, let them down, failed to treat them fairly, or whatever the judges wanted to say, because the, they knew that the Daily Mail, a newspaper you've mentioned, I think, already once tonight, um, the Daily Mail would um, come down on the judges like a ton of bricks and say how worthy they were, and they all needed to take a cut in pay like everybody else. So the judges have stepped back from that conflict, and given that the judges haven't attacked ministers, ministers have been rather more cautious in attacking judges. And I think that, you know, subject to the problems over legal aid, um, where I think the judges would side with the profession, um, I suppose things aren't quite as bad now as they might be. Mm -hmm. um, there are other areas of tension, future of the court service, independence, money, all sorts of things, but on the whole, you know, things aren't too bad. And then finally, Hannah's question um, about litigants in person, forum shopping and the Russians. I can't see what problem it can possibly be to our system that wealthy Russians come and litigate in the Rolls Building um, in the commercial court. Um, this is a valuable, invisible export. They bring a lot of money into the system. They don't pay a lot in court fees because the courts aren't yet charging a full economic rate to wealthy litigants who are choosing to use the I, UK as a litigant. I think Hannah might want to say she meant another court. No, you, we have to get a microphone, Hannah, because your millions of fans who will be watching this and listening for years to come want to hear you. But very quickly, this is most unusual. S sorry, I, I was specifically referring to the family court right. and to Lord Justice Thorpe's article in the Times uh, a couple of summers ago, which was in respect of a particular case involving Russians who didn't actually have very much connection. So your with point the is UK. a bunch of very rich so, people show up in the family division using the, up all resources. Is that the, it? The, the problem is that the resources are very stretched and how do we ensure that as many people have access to those resources when some are taking up vast amount I mean months okay, of fine. court time. So it's not the oligarchs the fighting over their contracts, it's the oligarchs trying to lose their partners and using British courts to do this, using up lots of time, which means you're not getting your clients the service they deserve. That's it, is it, more or less? I've acted for them, and I've acted Okay, we don't want to go into it totally, yeah, absolutely, sorry, yeah. Well, 
I'm not persuaded that it's a huge problem. Um, uh, they are at least, you know, contributing to lawyers' fees, even if they're not contributing very much in court costs. And I don't think that a few high-value um, matrimonial cases are causing major delays in the court's ability to deal with um, other cases. I think you're right to say that litigants in person are clogging up the courts. I think this is a major problem for the judges, and it's one that they are trying to deal with. The way in which they're dealing with it is pro bono. Um, in the Chancery Division and in the uh, Queen's Bench and Administrative Courts, there is now a lawyer on duty outside a specific court, I think it's Court 37 in the Law Courts, Court 10 in the Rolls Building, who is there to give instant help and perhaps a bit of quick representation to people who turn up and need representation um, and um, need a bit of quick help. Mm. Um, the judges realize this is cost effective. The lawyers are acting pro bono. It's quite good for their careers as young lawyers. Um, they're doing work they wouldn't otherwise do. They're getting to talk to clients, which they might not otherwise do. And it's an attempt by the system to keep things going, despite the fact that, as we all know, litigants in person, particularly on both sides, in a family case or in any case, really, are very difficult indeed, because at least if they're on one side, well, the lawyer on the other side can be reasonably helpful. But if they're on both sides, it's very, very difficult indeed. Um, I don't think that the answer to litigants in person is to try and stop access to the courts for people who presumably have a justifiable need to litigate in this country. Um, I hope that uh, I'm perfectly happy with the idea of um, court fees going up in high-value cases. Um, I'm perfectly happy if some of the um, uh, counsel and solicitors who do big money cases and make a lot of money out of these cases um, send their more junior members of chambers or law firms to help deal with the litigants in person. I don't think there is a scheme of the sort I've just described in the family division yet. All right, then I hadn't come across it. Oh, no, that's different. Okay. The personal support unit but, is different, no, well, and that's an excellent <coughs> scheme, but it's not a lawyer outside each Okay, court. well, wait. I mean, fascinating, and good that we know there is something, but not what Joshua's been describing. Yeah. Let's do a couple of quick part tweets. Yeah. Thanks, Joshua. Uh, should we go with this one? Yeah. Yeah, okay, I'm going to skip ahead. We, we'll we had a Duggan one, which you've kind of covered. Well, done, we might Duggan. come back to it, but... Uh, do you not want the Duggan one? Uh, no, we we might or might not. We've okay. done it, really, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, uh, this is from uh, M. Banerjee Palmer, who asks, does journalism and the public reaction it provokes increasingly alter the development, sorry, development of law and legal practices? Uh, yes, and it's a good thing it does. Um, uh, for example, today, Sir James Munby, President of the Family Division, issued guidance, um, which had been anticipated by something he said last term, which says, in general, more judgments in the family division and the court of protection should be made public and available to the press. Uh, the most important ones, the judges, the ones that um, judges think um, are, uh, should be published in the public interest are going to be transcribed at public expense and made available. Um, the ones that are slightly less interesting are going to be transcribed at the party's expense and the ones that nobody thinks are very interesting can be transcribed at the request of a member of the public or a journalist um, at the request of and at the expense of them. He, Munby, recognises very clearly that if judgments are not made public, then they are misreported. They are misreported either deliberately by people who have a motive to um, impugn uh, particularly the Court of Protection and to some extent the family courts. Um, they, are reported, uh, they are misreported accidentally by people who, cannot, who see a report which looks a bit dodgy but cannot get hold of the judgment in order to find out what really happened because the judgment hasn't been published. Um, he uh, recognises quite rightly that this damages public confidence in the legal system and he accepts that although making judgments available is not going to stop distorted reporting, it's going to minimise it by at least allowing 
serious journalists and others to see what really happened and report mm. it. Mm. So that's um, a way in which journalism and public reaction to judgments has affected the practice in two divisions, loosely speaking, of the High Court, um, which um, tended to proceed on the basis that they were dealing with private matters of interest only to the parties and very rarely made public. So that, that is um, an example of it. Um, and I wrote a piece yesterday in which I was critical of the policies and procedures of the Investigatory Powers Tribunal. And I like to think that not because I wrote this, but because um, the thing was written up by other people as well, that the Investigatory Powers Tribunal may change its policies um, and uh, provo uh, produce greater openness. Yeah. So the days are long gone. I don't know if you remember, was it Lord Justice Harmon who, who kicked a taxi driver and his defense was he thought he was a journalist? I well, have I got that right? Um, and if I haven't got it right, I rather hope he's died. Um, Although, <laughs> um, you, you've only, if you know what I mean. The only thing you've got wrong is you've promoted him to the Court of Appeal. <laughs> Which was um, very unlikely, yes, I imagine. Uh, well, he, he never did get promoted yeah. to the Court of Appeal. Um, um, yes, um, there was a hearing at his home which I rather foolishly um, uh, didn't think of going to, everyone else did, um, uh, at an early evening. Um, and he, um, he came out and um, um, he, he thought he was being jostled by the press. And uh, so he kicked out at somebody and this guy said, look, you know, I'm your taxi driver. <laughs> um, um, so Jeremiah Harmon had to retire because he took rather too long to deliver yeah. his last judgment. Yeah, he'd sort of forgotten he'd adjudicated, hadn't he? It went on and on over a year and a half or something. Well, he had it? certainly forgotten the case. Yeah. Um, yeah, so those were the days. I mean, those days have changed, haven't they? Well, he had to yeah. go. Yeah, he had yeah. to go. He had to go that, even then, yeah. He had to go as a result of the delay in delivering that judgment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll take that, uh, we'll skip the Duncan tweet from Liberty, sorry Liberty if you're here, and go on into a, one you've alluded to, which I want to add a supplementary on, the s European one. From what? Andrew, who is here, and Andrew D. Murray. Andrew, Andrew Murray. Andrew Murray. Is this the real person? Is that the real person over there? So we yeah. can compare in this case, usefully, <laughs> the two. Uh, we have it here. Do you want to so read it? Yes. Uh, what does Joshua think of <coughs> Lord Judge's view that the Strasbourg Court is not superior to our Supreme Court? And, and let me add to it. We were talking a bit about judges and politics in answer to Carl earlier, and I was thinking immediately of Lord Sumption, you know, who goes along, and gives a big speech which it's very hard not to see as a political intervention, which was about more or less this kind of thing. So I suppose a bit of should judges be doing it, and also particularly where Strasbourg fits. You've alluded to it a bit, but we'd be interested in that, I think. Um, Lord Judge uh, was quite careful not to say anything too controversial while he remained in office. Yeah. Um, he's now uh, retired uh, from the judiciary. Um, on Sunday night, there was a huge turnout at a dinner in his honor given by the other judges. He was a very, very popular Chief Justice, uh, a great leader of judges, much admired by them, much missed, um, and um, uh, 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 is still um, uh, treasurer of his inn this year, which is, um, you know, he's going to be pretty busy doing that. But he was very much admired as a, as a judge's judge, if you'll forgive the um, play on words, um, and um, greatly respected. Um, on the narrow point that Andrew asks about, um, of course he's right. Um, the Strasbourg Court is not superior to the UK Supreme Court in the sense that the Strasbourg Court cannot overturn decisions of the UK Supreme Court. Um, the most the Strasbourg Court can do is to uh, find that there has been a breach of the Human Rights Convention and as a matter of treaty obligations, it's up to the United Kingdom to comply with the finding of the Strasbourg Court. All this is pretty clear, pretty simple, and ought to be pretty well known. On the other hand, you can say in one sense that the Strasbourg Court is superior in that the Supreme Court can decide a case one way, the Strasbourg Court can look at the same case and say, well, we think there was a breach of human rights. You, the UK Supreme Court, have decided there wasn't. We say there was, and there are consequences. So to take the current example, the UK Supreme Court can say a whole life tariff, um, a whole life order, saying that 
Um, it is possible to sentence somebody to spend the rest of their life in prison, somebody who's convicted of murder and given a life sentence, um, is lawful even though there is no possibility of review. The Strasbourg court says, well, we think there has to be a review after a certain period. So in that sense, the Strasbourg court is saying that um, the UK Supreme Court got it wrong. Um, and if we assume that the government is going to play by the rules and is going to comply with the Human Rights Convention, then the government is required to change domestic law to fit in with the findings of the Strasbourg Court. And in practice, that means introducing a review of the sentence of somebody given a whole life order after a certain period, and 25 years is the obvious period because that was the period at which the Home Office used to review sentences of lifers until the Criminal Justice Act, uh, uh, until 2003, I think it was. Um, may not have got, got the right, right name of the legislation, but it was until um, 2003. Um, and um, perhaps every 10 years thereafter. So in the sense that the Strasbourg Court can require the law to be changed um, so that it's not what the UK Supreme Court said, then the Strasbourg Court can trump the UK Supreme Court. But it can't overrule it in the sense that lawyers understand overruling. Um, and in that sense, it's not superior in the hierarchy because, as I think the Court of Appeal will declare on Friday of next week, when the Lifers case comes before a five-judge court, um, the law as declared by the Supreme Court is good law until and unless legislation is passed. That was the view of Mr. Justice Wilkie in a case that he decided just before Christmas where he sentenced somebody to a whole life tariff. It was not the view of Mr. Justice Sweeney who has deferred sentencing the two men who murdered Lee Rigby and who passed a 40-year uh, tariff in a case of another murderer who might otherwise have got a whole life tariff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, we're going to go to another tweet, then the audience, and we'll be out of here before eight, so we're getting a bit pushed for time. But Sumption, Jonathan Sumption, Lord Sumption, totally political, not political, cautious, aggressive, because of course he had a political background, lots of judges have had, in his speech about the European Court I, and so I, on. I, I, know, I, know, I know about his speech. I'm thinking about his political background. I mean, he, wasn't, he wasn't active in politics. What, of course, he famously was, was not a judge before he became a member of the Supreme Court. Um, political advisor to Sir Keith Joseph, I think. Well, Pretty political. I suppose that goes back a long way. It does. Um, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't hold that against him. Um, but I do wonder whether if he'd served in the High Court and the Court of Appeal, he might be um, less willing to be as political as I think you rightly say he is. Um, I don't have too many problems um, with this sort of thing. It comes back in some ways to the conflicts of interest question that we started with. Mm. If you know what people think, then you can take account of them, uh, account of it. If you know what their views are, you can ask them to recuse themselves, to stand down, as somebody did in the case of Lord Steyne, because he'd made his views um, very clear on a particular political issue. Mm. Um, I, I, I'm not too worried about this sort of thing, um, but I am worried if the judges get too political and get too involved in slanging matches with the government, because I think that the judges are really the only um, arm of the Constitution in which the public as a whole still have some respect, and I think it's very, very important for that respect to be maintained, and I think that the judges on the whole understand that very well. Yeah, fair enough. We'll take a quick tweet, and then we'll go to the audience, yeah, and then we'll then probably have to wrap it up. There are a couple that's uh, fairly but similar. But we need to be so quick on this one. Yeah, yeah so there's uh, one from Mary Rahman who asks... Uh, with, uh, with Grayling proposing drastic cuts to legal aid, what future can law students expect in the profession? Similarly, uh, Liberty Bridge asks, what one question would you ask uh, Chris Grayling? Mm. Okay, it's sort of law students are just going to be in the little tent outside the court offering pro bono yeah. advice. Yeah, but who's going to pay them to do it and how are they going to earn a living? Um, I'm, you know, I'm rather glad that 
I'm at my end of the um, um, career path rather than, you know, um, the end of those of you who are, here who are undergraduates. Uh, but it's going to be very different. Um, there are, you know, the practice of law is going to be very different. Um, there's a report out today sponsored by Eversheds on what law students think the future of law is going to be. They're less interested in becoming partners. They're less interested in the career path that uh, existing lawyers are. It's going to be very different. You have to be flexible. You have to be imaginative. You have to be creative. You have to be confident. And it does help if you've got wealthy parents. <laughs> so um, that's, um, you know, uh, and also um, the other thing to tell people who are undergraduates rather than um, students doing vocational courses is there aren't nearly enough places at the bar. Um, and although um, going to uh, one of the best universities is going to increase your chances of pupillage and tenancy, um, there aren't enough places to go around for mm. a lot of people who have degrees in law from universities. And to some extent that applies yeah. to solicitors as well. So be cautious and don't assume um, that uh, law is the only profession and don't assume that law is a meal ticket for life as it wasn't even in my day but certainly may have been a few years earlier. So that, that's, the, um, that's the, the, the advice to law students. Um, you know, think carefully and, and look widely. And whatever you do, don't say, I want to give up law and go into journalism. Um, <laughs> if you want to go up law and go into journalism, um, do um, what um, Professor Michael Zander, who I'm delighted to see here today, Emeritus Professor here, uh, did, which was, is to go into teaching law uh, at the same time as writing about law. Uh, Michael Zander um, was effectively the BBC's legal correspondent before I was in the sense that he was called in by World at One to comment on the morning stories um, and by other programs uh, and, and broadcast uh, with great skill. Um, he was also um, the Guardian's legal correspondent uh, before they had a full-time legal correspondent uh, who was Claire Dyer. So he did a very great deal of uh, very distinguished journalism in his day um, before people like me pushed him out of the... Um, out of, the, uh, out of the field, but he had something else to fall back on, which is you know, uh, distinguished teaching here, uh, membership of royal commissions, and, and other um, very successful uh, roles within the law, um, and, and, a, and a bit of practice, perhaps, if any of that dried up. So you know, as many strings to the bow as possible, don't rely on making a living out of writing about the law. He's been waiting 20 years for you to come back to LSE to exact his revenge for your having jumped him. <laughs> and well, the question for... for well, it's for, worse because for, it's for, my wife was news editor of The Guardian at oh, the time. So she sacked him. Well, <laughs> I feel very badly about it, but at least, you know, you've got the day job, Michael. Um, uh, and Grayling, Mr. Grayling, Grayling, Mr. Grayling. Lord Chancellor Grayling. Um, the question, question I would ask him is what he's going to do about human rights. The question I want to know is what um, proposals he is going to try to get into the Conservative Manifesto um, uh, to deal with the Human Rights Act, the Human Rights Convention, the UK's membership of the Council of Europe, um, and the consequences of them, and how he sees this playing out. Uh, thank you. You might get a chance in some press well, conference when or other. When some point. Uh, I don't think it's a question Liberty might ask him, but I'm not going to risk asking her. The Stuarts are underused because of Twitter. I've discovered this. Uh, so look, let's give them excuses to move with Let's microphones. Some, uh, some quick, quick fire. This gentleman, that lady. We'll start with you, sir. I think we're getting pretty quick now because we want to be finished in the next five or ten minutes or so. Uh, name and question. And there's a lady over here to whom the microphone's going. Sir. Hello. Uh, my name's Alistair Sline. I'm a journalist with The Guardian newspaper. Um, <laughs> My question is about uh, female victims of sexual violence who routinely report that they're badly treated or don't feel safe in the courts or don't even feel ready to go to court. Um, just wanted to get your assessment on that and what could be done to improve the situation. Great. Thanks, Alistair. Succinct. Very helpful. And Madam. Hi, um, I'm Hermione, I'm a student, I'm a sixth form student uh, from Southend, uh, aspiring law student. I was just wondering, you've already touched slightly on uh, your opinion of the evolving um, role of lawyers in politics, and I was wondering, as aspiring lawyers, can we ex be expecting to be more involved in politics as it becomes more complicated and it more in need of lawyers uh, to help um, 
sort of supervisor process is going through at the moment. What's your name? Uh, Hermione. Hermione. Thanks, Hermione. Terrific. Uh, do we have one more? Let's take these two. Uh, we have one more gentleman here and one very quickly here. So let's take these two. That might then be it. I have a piece of gossip. I want to get some information later on, but that'll be the very end. <laughs> Sir. Hi there, Imran from Pearson. I just wanted to ask, who's the most impressive QC that you've observed? <laughs> nice one, Pearson. Thank you. From, from, it's very good. QC, very good. I love these gossipy ones. Uh, and this gentleman over here, have you got a good one? Like, who's the most attractive barrister he's ever seen or something like that? Or is there something else? Hey. No, no, you're not, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Your question, sir. Yes, away you go. Um, I'm a recent law graduate, having come from car repairs. I'm going from one distressed business to another. Um, my question to Joshua is, if you, were, if you were given a magic wand, how would you deal with the legal cuts? Personally, I would surcharge all the commercial cases. Brilliant. Thanks. What's your name, though? Lee. Lee. Thanks, Lee. Uh, it's going to need to be pretty quick, Joshua, but... Uh, Four of them, quite quick fire, actually. So away you go. Okay, Alistair's question. I suspect when a journalist asks me a question like this, he knows more about the answer than I do. Um, uh, I, I believe that um, quite a lot has been done to help um, uh, victims and uh, witnesses who give evidence in rape trials. There are special measures that can be introduced uh, behind a screen, CCTV. Um, there's a question of whether one could uh, record evidence before the trial, but then that leads to problems with cross-examination. You maybe you have the cross-examination earlier on, but then you know new stuff arises at the trial. It's not a very easy thing to resolve. Um, but um, I think uh, you know all one can do is to uh, you can take people to show them the court in advance. Um, but ultimately, you are deciding whether the witness is telling the truth, and not all victims do tell the truth. Some are confused, some are um, deliberately uh, telling um, false things. And in an adversarial um, system as we have, um, there is going to be a certain amount of pressure. I have once given evidence in court. I was being questioned by Helena Kennedy QC. I was asked, um, uh, I was simply giving character evidence on behalf of a colleague at the BBC who was being prosecuted. Um, it was slightly tense. Um, I found it quite nerve-wracking, um, even though I spend quite a lot of my time in court. Um, it must be much worse if you're being asked about your personal life. Um, but I haven't got any clever ideas. Um, I still think that it's necessary for people to give evidence and have it tested, although there are arguments as to how far counsel should go in cross-examining people in these circumstances. Hermione's question. Um, a long time ago, there were lots and lots of lawyers in the House of Commons, um, uh, so much so that the hours of the House of Commons were designed so that you would have a full-time career at the bar um, and then fetch up at the House of Commons and spend the afternoon and evening um, there. Uh, courts rose at four and Parliament didn't really get going until you know, mid-afternoon. Um, now Parliament has family-friendly hours and they're not so friendly to doing two jobs. Um, this is um, actually unfortunate because, you know, the, the system does depend on Parliament having quite a few lawyers in it. Um, there have been times when there hasn't been um, a suitable member of the House of Commons to serve as Attorney General and uh, a Solicitor General. In fact, both the law officers are in the House of Commons at the moment. Um, but there have been times when you had to go to the House of Lords, which was unsatisfactory. Um, it was also... A t uh, there was a time long, long ago, when it was thought that the Lord Chancellor ought to be a lawyer as well. Um, <laughs> so, um, lawyers do have a role in politics. Maybe what you were getting at was the point that um, uh, lawyers now have to take a rather political role because they have to fight for um, their position. They have to fight against legal aid cuts. Um, they have to be quite shrewd at um, getting through to politicians. And I think that's also true. So I don't think the two are inconsistent. It always struck me slightly odd that you occasionally had MPs sitting as part-time judges in the criminal court, people like Ivan Lawrence, who was a Conservative MP with quite strong political views. He sat as a judge. Alex Carlyle, Lib Dem MP in his... Well, he was Liberal. Yeah, I suppose he was Lib Dem um, MP in his time. Uh, and there was somebody from the Labour Party as, as well at one stage. Um, it's not inconsistent, provided everybody knows. 
Imran asks me about the most impressive um, QCs. Um, I think I'm going to mention two, um, both of whom have a lot of respect for one another, both of whom are very, very impressive in different ways. Uh, can you guess who I'm going to mention? I'm certainly not going to risk guessing yeah, who you're right. going to mention. All right. Well, the first is David Panic, Lord Panic, um, and the second is Dinah Rose. Yeah. Um, Dinah Rose is fearsome. Um, the judges are petrified of her. Um, I watched um, Dinah Rose against Claire Montgomery before the Supreme Court in the Assange case, and it was an extraordinary game of tennis. You know, it was it was you know bouncing back and forth, and it was you know well worth watching the whole thing for two days because you saw some superb ad advocacy. David Panic has this wonderful skill of making it appear so easy to the court that if they'd only just follow points one, two, and three, which he will read out at dictation speed, there's really only one answer, and it happens to be the one on his side. Now, he doesn't always win because he has the most impossible cases, um, but he does um, uh, uh, some superb advocacy, and although he does a lot of cases abroad these days, he does uh, a few pro bono cases in which uh, one of them was the, the Nicholson case in the Supreme Court just before Christmas, um, on uh, uh, assisted suicide and so on. Um, Lee's question about the magic wand and how we solve the problems of legal aid. Um, I think what I'd really like um, to do, and this relates back to the answer I gave earlier, is for ministers to be able to see the big picture, to realize that if they save a small amount of money out of their budget, it's going to cost the taxpayers a huge amount uh, from other people's budgets is going to have a downstream effect. And if they could only realize, um, take a broader view, I don't think they would push ahead with the cuts they're doing. Mm. My bit of gossip. When the Supreme Court started, Dyson, uh, John Dyson was initially not a lord. Yes. And then suddenly he sort of became a lord. Yes. And now they're all lords. And yet it's supposed <laughs> to have been a change. Yes. Uh, was it a pretend lord, so that if Lord Sumption turned up in the House of Lords, he'd be expelled? When they resign, are they not let into the Lords? Or are they just simply, how on earth does it work? Did they create a huge agitation about this and say they're not going to go and become members of the Supreme Court unless they're allowed to keep these bubbles? Or what happened? Yes, you must have some yes. gossip. No, I, I can tell you exactly what happened. I mean, the answer to almost all of those questions is yes. Um, <laughs> um, yes, they are pretend Lords in that they have the title Lord, um, but they don't have a seat in the House of Lords. I'm referring to those who became members of the Supreme Court um, after the um, uh, creation of the Supreme Court, in other words, who weren't previously law lords. The ones who were law lords were members of the House of Lords. Um, ironically, while they are sitting as judges, they can't sit and vote in the House of Lords. Uh, and that includes people like Lord Judge, um, as Lord Chief Justice, um, and Lord Newberger, uh, both of whom are members of the House of Lords. And while serving as judges, not judge now, but certainly Newberger now, they can't take part in debates. People like uh, Sumption, Toulson, uh, Scottish judge Lord Reid, um, uh, don't um, have membership of the House of Lords. Now, the confusion, um, the, the reason for this is that it was thought very odd for um, a court to be consisting of some people who are known as Lord, and the others who are known as Sir or Dame. It was thought to um, make it rather difficult for people, uh, even though you'd address them as my Lords, even though they're not Lords um, necessarily, um, and it was thought to be invidious because the Supreme Court was meant to be of similar status to the House of Lords. Um, there were also um, Scottish judges, uh, like Reid, who um, come from a jurisdiction where the title given to a judge, even a first instance judge, is Lord, even though they don't, of course, have membership of the House of Lords. And so the Scottish judges would turn up and say, well, I have been given uh, the title Lord by letters patent by the, I don't know, the Scottish uh, um, um, heraldry, I can't remember, the Gal no, not Gal anyway, the, the, he, he, you know, people, Scottish judges have the title Lord, preceded by the abbreviation on for honorable which means, of course, honorary, but is actually short for honorable. Um, and they're not, therefore, lords at all. Um, but they could, could turn up and call themselves lords. So the only people who wouldn't be lords would be people appointed to the Supreme Court um, after the creation of the Supreme Court 
who weren't Scottish. <laughs> this was thought to be the most appalling mess, and so um, the Lords pressed for, the, the members of the Supreme Court pressed for, and eventually, after a couple of years, got this pretend status, uh, whereby they have the style of Lord, but not the status. And it is said that those who retire from the Supreme Court in those circumstances will probably be offered peerages, but that's not a promise. Well, I don't think anybody else in Britain <laughs> could have described that as well as Joshua just has done. And in a way, it, I mean, that was an amazing story, not remotely meandering and covering a most quintessentially British thing. But it captures, I think, the <laughs> service to the nation provided by Joshua Rosman, the precision and the journalistic understanding and the bit of gossip. So thank you for that. You didn't and warn me in advance. I, I gave you no warning in advance. Yeah. And I gave you no warning in advance. Uh, I think that's pretty well it. Uh, as you know, we've been experimenting with this form. And it's a big ask for you all uh, and uh, to go into this without the big set speech followed by the questions followed by end. So you've played your part in it. We've got a few more such events coming up. Uh, and we've spiced it up a bit. We've got a debate. We've got uh, Jonathan here from the Human Dignity Trust on the 29th. I do hope some of you, we've got a big audience now, can come to these. Uh, this is a debate on privacy. We've got Hazel Blairs, whom uh, Joshua will remember well as previous minister and now Intelligence and Security Committee. Uh, Professor Sir Raymond Oman, oh, it's a fantastic cast there. Matthew Ryder, my colleague at Matrix. And then we're experimenting with, the, I don't know if we'll be sued by the BBC, it will be a question of law where we have a kind of panel, and you get to ask questions of the panel. And, and, uh, uh, and that'll be an opportunity for our own colleagues to reflect on contemporary issues and so on and so forth, all open to the public, all with various hashtags, uh, and, and all coming up pretty soon. So I hope that some of you will consider coming to those, and we'll certainly be tweeting about them. Thanks to Bradley for the tweeting. He's, without him, we couldn't do any of this, to be honest with you. And also, all of this will be on the web. There's a chap with a camera back there. And we've got much better at that, and it's much easier watch than it used to be a few years ago. And apparently, tens of thousands of people listen, and many, many people watch long after the event. Thanks to the Stuarts. Sorry, you're relatively underemployed by the new move to technology. I shouldn't tell Alan if I were you. We might have numbers reduced. But as far as we're concerned, all of you did a fantastic job. Thank you very much. Uh, mainly, you know, mainly, as we finish, Thank Joshua for coming along, giving up his evening, and engaging so completely in this innovative form of communication. Joshua, thank you very much. Thank you.